were not in the 401 class. Um, the heck with us. Okay. So um, this, this is kind of fast backwards. Um, we talk about our extended reach architect software in the, in the 401 class, and that's a uh, Fort Gregg Hydraulics and Mobile Stability Program that, that Kane has been developing for years. Um, and we basically walk through how to use the software, uh, a little bit about you know, what the plots tell you. But, but I realize that that doesn't make a lot of sense unless you kind of have the context of why the software even exists in the first place. And I'm going to kind of go through that. What exactly is extended reach drilling? Why, why did we even make this software? What sort of problems can you solve with it? What sort of problems are typical of extended reach wells? Chances are that um, those of you that are drilling the industry and work in a drilling career, you're going to encounter, if not extended reach wells, very long horizontal wells. And while a lot of horizontal wells are not categorized as extended reach necessarily, a lot of the sort of problems that we have to solve in huge ERD wells, we also have to solve in horizontal wells. And um, anyway, I, I think hopefully you'll find some examples. Uh, as I said in the 401 class, I graduated in 99 with Dr. Hoffman. Um, I started and always worked in drilling. Um, started with mobile and then Exxon Mobile, and then a little company. After uh, figuring out that Exxon Mobile wasn't for me, I worked for a little operator by the name of Pure Resources, and uh, my wife decided that that wasn't for me because she didn't want to live in the middle of Texas the rest of her life. So uh, we moved to Houston, and I joined K and M uh, 13 years ago. K and M, real small company, we were like five guys in a garage at that time. Now we're 50 guys in a slightly larger garage. Um, but we're, we're very small. We specialize in extended reach and complex directional wells. Uh, we're owned by Summerday now. In 2008, the previous owners sold us to Summerday, and we'll talk about that. We still remain a, kind of an independent arm. We're not, we don't sell Summerday. We sell Um uh, But yeah, we'll talk about us and, and also the extended reach and sort of, sort of problems we solve. Uh, the company's been around for 25 years. We started in the 80s in California. Really became engineering consultants in the 90s. Uh, a lot of work in Australia in the early days of Extended Reach, California, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in 2008, Summer's Day decided that they liked what they saw and they bought us. Uh, it was privately owned before that now. They sold it into their drilling measurements group. Although we're small, we work all over the world. We work for the biggest of the super majors and we work for the smallest of the mom and pops. Um, I've got two passports almost completely full and I hadn't ever been outside of North America when I graduated. So, uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of interesting work all over the world. There's only about 15 of us. Last year, um, I, um, I decided a, a, a kind of a lifestyle change. I used to manage all of our engineers and uh, eventually got tired of the Houston uh, lifestyle. And so I stepped down as engineering manager and handed over that responsibility to one of my engineers. And now I work for her and uh, I get to do all the fun stuff. So I live in Bozeman and just work on software and solving clients' problems. But what we're really good at is hydraulics, hole cleaning, torque and drag, geomechanics, um, the typical problems that come up in extended reach wells. We try to focus on preventing problems rather than coming back and solving problems, although usually people pick up the phone and call us after they've had a problem. Um, nobody calls consultants when things are going good, it's only after a disaster. So we come in, try to fix a problem, and then going forward we say, okay, well this is the way you can keep this from ever happening again in the future. What's an extended reach well? How many of you have heard that terminology? Okay, so that's good. You know, years ago, people didn't even know what that meant. Um, a lot of people in the industry define that as uh, a well that has a step-out ratio of 2 to 1. And what I mean by that is if you were to draw a trajectory of a well, if you, if you calculated the horizontal displacement, how far it goes sideways compared to how far it is up and down, vertical, the true vertical depth, if you took the horizontal displacement divided by the true vertical depth, if that ratio is greater than 2.0, that's what people say is the beginning of extended reach, people, whoever they are. Um, that would mean in the Bakken, if you have a 10,000 foot lateral, a 10,000 foot PVD, that's not even close to being extended reach by the classical definition. But really, a 10,000 foot lateral is, is a long lateral no matter where you're at, you know, regardless of the PVD. So we don't really like that terminology necessarily. The sort of technical problems you have to solve, though, change depending a lot on your true vertical depth. If we're at a very shallow horizon, now, there's not that many reservoirs that are less than 5,000 foot TVD. I mean, in places there are, but generally around the world, less than 5,000 foot is pretty stinking shallow. But the big problems that we face there are drag, overcoming drag so that tubulars will run in the hole, uh, and equivalent circulating density. And we'll talk a lot about ECD here in a minute. 
between five and 10,000 feet is kind of the ideal range to drill long extended reach wells. It's a good mechanical balancing point. Most wells and most extended reach wells fall into this medium TBD territory. Super deep wells, like um, Deepwater Gulf of Mexico, those make it challenging to drill long departures, but for different reasons than when we're up here real shallow. The main things that you force, that you deal with here are just huge forces, massive brute forces required to deal with the incredible tension and torque, pressure. Um, I just worked on a project for Chevron for some of the, the kind of world record deep water wells, and yeah, they need to get you know, unobtainium to be able to drill those things. It's pretty impressive loads, four million pounds of, of hook load of surface. That's a lot. Um, it depends a lot on whether you're dealing with a real big rig package or a limited rig package. So some places we're forced to work with smaller rigs than what we really like to have. Offshore is usually not the case. Well, these stopped on you know, semi-subs and drill ships. Platforms, sometimes we're faced to use an old platform rig that just doesn't have the capacity that we like. Um, water depth complicates things, and so does the rocks complicates things. This graph it represents um, what's well, called the dog nose plot to begin with. And the reason why we call it the dog nose plot is its profile, its shadow, kind of looks like the nose of a dog, if you have a healthy imagination, I guess. It kind of helps if you shake it in a little. Uh, the dots represent the true vertical depth and horizontal displacement of all the extended reach wells that we know about around the world. So somebody somewhere drilled these wells. And you can see that there's only a few way out here, and there's only a few down here. There's a big concentration right in here, and that kind of points us to that sweet spot that I'm at. When you get over this two to one ratio, that's the, the traditional definition, um, all the wells in the red would be considered extended reach and all the wells over here would be considered not extended reach. We don't really like that definition. We like kind of a, a more staggered approach. So we've got four different categories, low reach in green, medium reach in blue, extended reach in yellow, and very extended reach in red. And you'll notice that depending on your TBD, right, we change our definition. If you're real shallow, you don't have to go out very far before it's extended reach. Likewise, if you're real deep, you don't have to go out very far before it's extended reach. Biggest wells in the world over here, somewhere in the territory of 38,000 feet of displacement. So that is one heck of a lateral. <laughs> these aren't all laterals, by the way. In fact, most of these are not purely horizontal. The last part might be horizontal. The real trick of the extended reach well is getting from surface down to where the oil is. That's usually the application for extended reach. Not staying in reservoirs, but getting to where the reservoir actually is. Biggest well in the world was drilled by ExxonMobil a um, year and a half ago. Chivo V40. So this project's been ongoing since 2004. Um, did some work on, on the early well. But, um, Z40, 40, almost 43,000 foot measured depth, 40,000 feet displacement, and uh, a ratio of 5 to 1. Which remember I said two to one is kind of the beginning. This is considerably longer than that. It's not the highest ratio well, but it is the longest measure depth and longest displacement well. And what's really crazy is look at the, the hole sizes and depths that we're dealing with. 18,000 feet of 17 and a half inch hole, and they run 13 and 5 eighths casing in that at about 83 degrees inclination. So, you know, a Bakken horizontal, about the longest horizontal that's ever been drilled in the Bakken is out here to about 13,000 feet. These guys are just setting surface casing. They're just getting warmed up. They haven't even done anything interesting yet at that point. Then they drill 12 and a quarter inch hole to 36,000 feet and set 95 eighths. Then they finally get into the reservoir, and you notice that the reservoir section is really not that long. So it's all spending millions of dollars just getting to where the reservoir is at. 12 and a quarter hole. So that big, 30,000 feet. Unbelievable. It's also the biggest rig in the world. They've got four pumps. The biggest top drive, high pressure system, huge hoisting capacity, tons of space to store tubulars. Um, it, it's convenient, or more convenient to do this with their equipment than it is most people's equipment. And by the way, they drill these wells in like 40 days. Their first wells were not 40 days. The very first well that I was involved with in Sockland was 270 days, and it stopped somewhere around here. Exxon doesn't advertise that well. They advertise their, their, their recent well. They get a lot better the more wells they drill, and that's usually the way it goes with extended reach. Your first well is a train wreck, and your last well is amazing, and you know, somewhere in between, hopefully, you learn something. Put that in perspective. How many of you have had uh, internships or been so unfortunate as to have to go to Houston for something? Nobody here's from Houston, are they? 
the reason why I don't live in Houston anymore. If you put a rig downtown Houston, and, you know, 610 Loop, and then Beltway 8 on the outer outskirts, you could drill from downtown to 610 with a 20,000 foot displacement well, which really isn't that far after what we just saw Exxon was doing. 40,000 foot well, that's about where Exxon is, will get you halfway to Beltway 8. And in the near future, we'll see a 60,000 foot well, and that would essentially get you all the way out to Beltway 8. So Exxon, where I used to work at Exxon up here uh, at Greens Point, um, I would say, you know, I would rather drill to Greens Point than actually drive to Greens Point. <laughs> Greens, Point is, Greens Point is known for murders and rapes and, you know, other things. <laughs> Greens Point, Point really want to be involved with. See, that's where the AED conference is this spring. Well, so. <laughs> you might want to pass this year. <laughs> there literally is a whole bevy of crack houses just adjacent to the parking lot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> There's a big billboard there. It's, it's, right. yeah. it's, turned, it's, Don't hide it. it's, it's nearly that bad. <laughs> Why on earth would you would you do this? This is not convenient to drill thirty thousand feet from the quarter hole. One would be that you don't have much option where you could put your rig. You've got this big rig. You want to put it wherever the oil is, but you can't for some reason. Um, the other reason might be that it's actually cheaper to drill a few really long wells than to drill lots of really short wells. Uh, and then the last one would be, and this is kind of the exception, kind of the non-traditional theory, is, well, you can put the rig wherever you want, but you just need to drill lots of reservoir in order to make the, the well profitable. That would be like a Bakken type application, where you, you have really bad rock, but if you drill enough of it, all of a sudden it's not that bad. And so it really just boils down to economics. Extend or reach wells make you money, whether you're talking about $30 oil or $120 oil, because they're keeping your costs down or increasing your production. Those are the two sides of our you know, dollar per barrel equation. So Saucon Island, the, the application for extended reach in Saucon Island is there's a bunch of oil out here in the ocean. Here's the, the huge field that Exxon's developing. And they could put a, an offshore rig out there. And in a lot of applications, it would be better to put an offshore rig out there. The problem is that's what Saucon looks like in July. This is what Saucon looks like every other month in July. High Arctic, this is high latitude. You know, we're talking very cold, frigid environment. It's like Alaska, um, and it's expensive to put an offshore rig in an environment that's like Alaska. And so what Exxon figured out is they can actually reduce the overall development cost, even though they're drilling big, long wells, if they don't have to put offshore structures out there. Now, Shell has a different approach. They have offshore structures on their development, but they're a little bit further offshore where it's a bit outside the bounds of, of what Extender Reach can do. But Exxon saves millions of dollars every year by putting a rig on the coast and drilling the wells out there to where the oil is. Another application, um, this is the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company uh, over in the UAE. They're the, one of the, I think it's the fifth largest oil field in the world, the upper Zakam field. You never hear about it. You always hear about Guar and you know, everything else the Saudis are doing. But um, what's really interesting in Abu Dhabi, they've got this massive oil field that's been on production since 78, and they've extracted like 10% or 15% of the recoverable reserves. <coughs> it's big. And the problem is, this 30 mile by 15 mile field, is that in those days, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company had this philosophy that you couldn't drill any further out sideways than your true vertical depth. Well, the reservoir is at about 8,000 feet, so they installed enough platforms to be able to cover the entire field with 8,000 foot step out wells. And I mean, obviously, they just scratched the surface if they've only recovered 15% of the oil. Well, they partnered with ExxonMobil a couple of years ago, and ExxonMobil said, God, 8,000 feet, are you kidding me? That's nothing. What we could do is have localized drill centers. Let's just build like three or four islands, and we'll put all of our wells and you know, a couple of rigs on each island and just drill long wells from these centralized locations. We'll centralize production, we'll centralize drilling. You know, there's economies of scale to be gained by doing that. They were able to reduce their overall development cost, I want to say, by 30 or 40 percent by going to this, you know, long wells rather than short wells. <coughs> and then the last one is the only reason why anybody even knows where North Dakota is. <laughs> My wife's from North Dakota, and whenever she introduces herself to people, they're like, where's that? Is that, is that by Massachusetts? <laughs> no, not exactly. Up until, you know, about 2004, even people from South Dakota couldn't point to North Dakota on the map. But <laughs> when they became one of the largest oil producers in the United States, then people all of a sudden figured out where it was. But this is all because of long displacement horizontals and hydraulic fracturing. And, um, you know, that combination obviously has a big 
uh, economic impact for the state and for everybody who operates it. Okay, so those are the reasons why we drill extended reach. What are the sorts of technical problems that we run into when we try to drill long wells? Vertical wells are pretty easy, long wells are more complicated. Uh, one of the biggest limiters is torque. And torque is high because we've got high inclination and a lot of pipe laying on the low side of the hole. Gravity anchors that pipe to the low side, and when we try to turn it, there's a lot of resistance. So the longer the lateral, the more torque there is. We tend to use big tubulars as well when we drill extended reach. We've got to have a lot of flow rate to clean the hole. We've got to get a lot of hydraulic energy downstairs in order to get the cuttings out. So we've got big heavy stuff stretched out a long ways, torque is high. So to combat that, we tend to have to develop high torque connections on our pipe. pipe the connection on the pipe is one of our weak points. Um, that's kind of the brute force method, just make bigger stuff, the top drive, bigger top drive and, and stronger connections. Or what more and more people are doing now is, is looking at steel and saying, is steel really the best material to make a drill string out of? Is there any other material that might be better? And it turns out that aluminum is a fantastic material to make drill strings out of for extended reach wells because it's one third the density, but it's only about half the strength. The strength to weight ratio is much better, especially when you submerge it for aluminum than it is for steel. So more and more people are starting to use aluminum drill pipe to get the torque down rather than having to buy a bigger top drive or stronger connection. ECD, so equivalent circulating density. This is um, the effective <coughs> density that the wellbore feels when the pumps are on due to the friction of the mud moving <coughs> up the annulus. So because our annulus is long, and because our true vertical depth doesn't really change, and I'll explain that in a minute, we tend to have very high ECD in a horizontal well. In fact, you're always going to have higher ECD in a horizontal well than what you would in an equivalent vertical well. So to combat ECD, we need either a bigger hole or smaller pipe so that there's more annular space. The bigger your annulus, the lower the friction pressure will be, and therefore the lower the ECD will be. Well, unfortunately, that takes some calculation. It takes some engineering. You have to actually crunch the numbers to figure out what is the right hole size, what is the right pipe size to drill a well with in order to prevent this from being a problem. That's not usually what people do. They just go out and use what they have, and it creates all sorts of problems, and then they spend months trying to unravel the problems that they've created. Other problems that we've got pretty good at solving, so they're not as big of issues now, but drag and buckling is definitely an issue to be aware of. And of course, on these long horizontal wells, if you have a lot of pipe laying on the low side, all of this pipe is in compression when you're trying to move it forward, when you're trying to advance it down the well bore. Every joint has to get pushed. And that force that we use to push the pipe is coming from the weight of the pipe in the vertical. Well, when we've got real high ratio wells, there's not much vertical, and there's a whole heck of a lot of horizontal. So you don't have much force to drive that string in the ground. And eventually you reach a point where the pipe will not go in the hole under its own weight. You can't just let go of it and watch it fall down the hole. It'll actually stop. There's more drag in the lateral than there is weight of pipe in the vertical. So maybe it doesn't go anywhere. Well, to overcome that, we've created things like rotary steerable tools. I think Baker Hughes is going to come and talk about their auto truck tool. That's one of the technologies that we use in extended reach because when we're rotary drilling or rotating the pipe, all of the friction gets converted from axial, being oriented axially, to being oriented in the around and around direction. And what I mean by that is instead of having drag, we have torque. We have to contend with the torque, but at least we don't have any drag when we rotate. Rotation is an incredibly beautiful way to overcome friction. The trouble is for casing, casing is not usually designed to be rotated. Now we're doing more and more of that. People are going to come and talk about casing drilling. Casing drilling, though, usually is not done in highly deviated wells because torque gets exceptionally high when we have big diameter heavy casing. We might need 200,000 foot pounds of torque capacity to turn a 20,000 foot string of 9 and 5 eighths casing. So rotating casing is not an option unless we float it. And flotation is just kind of a um, slang term for not filling the pipe. When we run the casing in the hole, if we don't put mud on the inside, we're able to use the effects of buoyancy to make the pipe effectively much, much lighter. Rather than 47 pound casing weighing 43 pound per foot when it's buoyed in mud, when it's mud on the inside, mud on the outside, if we run it in completely empty, it might only weigh two pounds per foot. Well, if I only have two pound per foot casing, that doesn't take hardly any force at all to drive it into the ground. It's a super easy, but misunderstood technology that's so used very regularly. Did you say with the mud in the hole and you've got it at horizontal, is you only put in half the mud in the mud so that it floats easier? Well, there's, there's two different ways of doing it. Um, the simplest way of floating casing is you run the casing in the hole. There's mud, of course, in the hole itself. 
but there's no mud inside the casing. So you've got um, heavy mud on the outside, nothing on the inside, the casing becomes very, very light. Okay. Now, that works to a certain point. Beyond that point where you just can't get the casing going home any further, we can use a technique called selective flotation, where we put a baffle in the casing. So this is a temporary seal that allows us to put mud in the vertical part of the hole where there's no drag or friction. Yet we still got the really light stuff out here in the lateral, and we're using this heavy stuff to push this really light stuff. And then once we get the casing to the bottom, this valve opens in this baffle, and it allows the mud to flood down into this chamber, and now it's just like you know, a regular cement job once you get the casing in the hole. But up until that point, when there's no mud in here, you can't circulate the casing. That's one of the reasons why people don't like it when they first hear about it. They're like, okay, we're going to run the casing in the hole, but you can't circulate. Nope, I don't like that. Why don't you like that? I've never done it that way. Sorry, I've never driven the extended reach well either, so you got to get over it. So that technique, pretty powerful. It's something that we can simulate in the software. Um, I didn't talk about it in the class. But... Can you circulate in an emergency if you had a well control Yes, situation? absolutely. Okay. If there was some reason why you had to circulate, you just pressure up, the valve opens, you can circulate, and you can deal with your problem. Now, you've lost that, that um, buoyancy effect. You may have to pull the casing out and, and run it back in. Well, but yeah, it's not a uh, you know um, kamikaze method for sure. Other big issue that we deal with, particularly on the QDD wells, where we also tend to use high mud weights, is high pump pressures. Uh, there's a lot of friction through the inside of the drill string. In fact, what you probably saw in 301 is that most of your pump pressure is a result of the parasitic pressure losses by pumping down the inside of the drill pipe. It's not mostly coming from the bed. It's not mostly coming from the annulus. It's mostly coming from the inside of the pipe. Well, it's even more so in a long while because you've got a lot of drill pipe. So to combat that, we use bigger diameter drill pipe. In 12 and a quarter hole, we tend to gravitate towards 6 and 5 eighths or 5 and 7 eighths drill pipe rather than traditional 5 inch drill pipe. Almost every rig on the planet's got some 5 inch drill pipe. Very few rigs have 6 and 5 eighths or 5 and 7 eighths pipe. More and more rigs are coming with those sizes, but particularly on the rigs that we tend to be able to find, we have to go and rent or buy bigger diameter pipe or bigger diameter pumps, or sometimes both. Uh, tension, to cope with the tension loads, we're having to come up with stronger and stronger steel grades. So when I first graduated, S135 was the strongest, greatest drill pipe that you would find. And then not long after that, B150 became really popular, 150,000 PSI. Now, um, ultra deep water and ultra ERD are using 165 KSI field strength material. So the metallurgists are getting better and better and better, getting stronger and stronger and stronger material. Um, 1,250 ton hoisting, you know, it used to be that a 500 ton top drive, 500 ton blocks is really big and stuff. Or, you know, if you had a crazy, well, maybe 750. It wasn't until maybe 10 years ago that I heard about 1,000 ton top drive. Well, now a 1,000 ton top drive doesn't even get Chevron started on their anchor project. They have to have 1,500 and 1,750 ton top drives and blocks in order to in order to be able to run that case. Think about what that means. 1,750 tons, 2,000 tons, of course, is 4 million pounds. 4 million pounds. Telemetry, so how we talk to the downhole tools. Um, mud pulse telemetry, that's what almost everybody uses. But as we get further and further and further out, the signal that the MWD is sending to us at service gets more and more and more attenuated. It gets weaker. And so it's hard to hear it. And so we have to come up with crazy techniques to be able to interpret what the MWD is telling us versus what the noise from the pumps is trying to, trying to create to the signal. So wired drill pipe, acoustic telemetry, um, those are all kind of technologies right now that are going to support our adventure out into beyond 40,000 foot wells. Do you have viable acoustic right now? Uh, for short wells, yeah. Uh, nobody's done it on 40,000 foot. But up in Canada, um, there's several projects that are using acoustic telemetry. And they, you know, it's slowly getting better. Honestly, I think if somebody was wanting to drill a 60,000 foot well, it, it'd be really wise. It would be their only option right now. Maybe 10 years from now. So acoustic, the interesting thing about acoustic is um, they've got this device, like an MWD, that it looks like a series of little compact discs of like CD. Does anybody know what a CD looks like? <laughs> audience. Um, Basically, they can send an electrical signal through them that causes them to pulse. And it, it creates a sound wave that travels up the drill string. 
and you, therefore you, you've got the steel as your transmission line rather than the column of mud. And because the steel is a solid instead of a liquid, there's less attenuation of signal as it moves up through your steel drill string. Um, it does get attenuated, and the tool drums create a real problem because they're a big uh, impedance change. But the hope is that with repeaters in the drill string, that one day acoustic telemetry would allow higher data rate transmission and stronger signals in, in long lines. Not quite there yet. Position uncertainty. You guys will probably dive into this when you get into directional drilling, but the problem is we don't know where the hole is, which is a big problem. The reservoir engineers think that we know, uh, and you usually don't want to tell them that we don't know, but in reality, we don't know where the hole is. And that's because every time we take a survey, you know, we might take a survey 300 to 500 times throughout the course of a well. And that's done with an instrument that's in a certain location, and it's measuring the inclination of the borehole and the azimuth of the borehole. The problem is that instrument is not perfect. It's got a little bit of error associated with it, and those errors add up. So over the course of taking 500 measurements, imagine if you were measuring you know, across the length of this desk, and you were measuring one inch at a time, you know, because there would be a little bit of error with each one of your inch uh, increments, by the time you got to the end of the desk, you'd be off by quite a bit. Well, it's the same problem of uh, when we surveyed a wellbore. So there's, there's this area where the wellbore could be, what we call the ellipse of uncertainty, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the further and further and further out you go. And eventually you get to such a long well that the area of uncertainty is larger than your oil flow. So that's a real problem because you're basically spending $100 million in telling the reservoir department, well, we might be in the reservoir or we might not. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll know soon when we perforate. All right, so we're going to talk about the big two. The big two technical problems. Yeah. Oh, you know, what did Exxon do to get their pipe? On their 9 and 5 8 casings, and a lot of their 13 and 5 8 casings were floated. Absolutely every one of the 9 and 5 8s definitely floated. The, um, the liner, their production liner on bottom, fortunately because it, oops. Yeah. 13 and 3 a lot of them were floated. 9 and 5 8s, all of them were floated. Production liner, they, they did it a couple different ways. So in the early days, they had liners that they could rotate in because they were short enough that they didn't create that high torque, so that was a good solution. Eventually, they went to screens. And a lot of screen manufacturers, sand screens, they don't like you to rotate the screen for fear that it will damage the screen. And you'll spend all this money getting the completion in the ground, and then you still produce sand. So they don't want to rotate the screens themselves. But we know that rotation is a good way to overcome drag. And since the vast majority of the well is just drill pipe and cased hole, they started running a swivel, which is basically a clutch mechanism above the screens, so that they could rotate the drill string independent of the screens themselves. So you remove all of this axial drag, and the only drag you really have to overcome is the stuff that the screens create. So that's a really elegant way to solve that problem. Did they, did they think about running any heavier pipes for 13? If it was if it was a shorter weld, that would work. The problem for them is that the magnitude of the, pro, the the drag that they've got here. There's just so much drag that even if you had nine inch drill collars in this part of the hole, it's just not enough to overcome all the drag that you create in that super long section. I just wonder if they're 13 and 5 inch or consider running 14 inch on top or something. Uh, yeah. So on the shorter welds, that would probably work. And what they ended up discovering is even on this well, they didn't float the 13 and 5 8s. This is the longest one they, they did. It's not the longest 13 and 5 8s, but the longest well. Um, they found out that when they really got good at their directional drilling, their friction factors are so low that this string would slide in the hole. And they didn't have to do anything extra or unnecessary. They had the equipment to be able to if something weird happened, but yeah, they looked out and didn't have to float it. That's actually why it's 13 and 5 8s. It's, it's really heavy wall casing. Because if they ran traditional 13 and 3 8, first the casing would collapse if they ran it empty. Um, it's not that deep a TVD, but it's deep enough. 13 3 8 really doesn't have much collapse strength at all. And the other problem is 13 and 3 8 would become positively buoyant for the mud weights that they're using. And what positive buoyancy means is that the casing would actually float out of the hole. So you're running it in, or you're trying to, but when you stop and put it in the slips, it actually comes out of the well hole. That happens when we cement casing sometimes. So one of the first cement jobs I ever saw was 20-inch casing. 
uh, being cemented in Louisiana in a swamp on a barge rig. And they ran this casing in the ground, and then they chained down the casing. They, they basically had chains on the rig floor that were crossing over the cement head. And I said, what's going on here? What's with the chains? And they're like, well, you know, if we don't do that, then the casing will jump out of the hole. No, you're you wrong about it. Gravity doesn't just shut off because you're semantic. You know, I've, I've been to college. I know how gravity works. Right? Like, no, it's not because of gravity. It's because we got this like 15 and a half pound cement in the annulus, and we're displacing the cement job with just water. And the density difference creates such a huge buoyant force that will launch this casing out of the ground. Right. Okay. Gonna write that down. So similar problem with 13.3. Torque is our big issue to solve. Well, the first question that we often get, like especially when we work with national oil companies, national oil companies usually don't have the best engineers, by the way. Um, they'll say, well, you say we have high torque. Uh, why do we even rotate? Why don't we just not rotate? Well, you want to drill, right? Yes. Then you have to rotate. Oh. How about motor? Yeah, you could use a motor, but the problem is the sliding. When you have to slide drill in a long displacement well, there's so much drag friction you know, uh, acting axially along the pipe that when we want to orient the string, we can't get any weight to the bit. Yeah, we can turn the string and point the motor whatever direction we want to go, but we can't actually push the string and get weight to the bit so that we can cut her off. That's why we have rotary steerable tools. The whole end game here is to rotate, because when we rotate, friction basically disappears. It doesn't totally disappear. We can calculate the distribution of friction, and it's just a simple vector problem. Everybody remembers vectors, right? Is that in physics one or two or three? I can't remember now. But this is like the simplest vector problem you'll ever work. Um, we've got axial velocity if we're trying to move forward, and we've got circumferential velocity if we're trying to turn. Now, usually, we're either doing one or the other. We're either turning and not moving, or we're moving and not turning. But when we're drilling, rotary drilling, or reaming in the hole, you're doing both. You've got some component of axial velocity, some component of circumferential velocity. Well, when you're moving in two different directions, that creates a vector. So we've got a resultant vector. The resultant vector is good old Pythagorean's theorem, square root of the sum of the squares. So my axial velocity squared plus my circumferential velocity squared. The circumferential velocity is just the circumference of your tool joints times your RPM. So that one's real easy to work out. What's tricky is how much friction gets allocated to the axial direction and how much friction gets allocated to the circumferential direction. We've got a friction factor. We've got, let's call it an axial friction factor. The effective axial friction factor, that's the prime, is my normal axial friction factor that I would observe if I'm not rotating. I'm just moving the string up and down, there's gonna be a certain friction, but it's called 0.3. The effective friction factor is my axial velocity or divided by my resultant vector. So the goal here to make your effective friction almost nothing is for this number to be small and this number to be large. Well, what would have to be true to make this number large but this number small?